This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Ginger Bianco on January 6th, 2018 in Greenwood Lake, New York for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much for participating. Oh, you're welcome. It is an honor. Ah, thank you. It is. Um, so, like I said on the phone, we start at the very beginning. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and your family of origin, parents, siblings... Okay. Or we can start with where you grew up, if that's easier. Well, I'm from, you know, I pretty much, I mean, I was born in Flushing, but I'm from Long Island. You know, I grew up in Valley Stream, and um, I went to school there, and I hated it, you know. And, uh, you know, I was never really that close with my brother or my sister. You know, we, I mean, we all got along and stuff like that, but, um, you know, I had different ideas and different thoughts, you know, growing up. I was always like a dreamer. So I was always not, like when I used to sit in school, I would do the same thing. I'd go, why am I here? And I'd look out the window. I couldn't feel attachment to anything, um, my family or school, because I always just knew there was something else. Like it didn't fit. That, that suit didn't fit me. I didn't feel right. But um, I had a normal childhood, you know, you know, hung out, Christmas, you know, sausage sandwiches, and all the, all the typical family stuff. It was great. Sometimes I miss those times, you know, when they were like that. But where were you in where you have a brother and sister? Right. Old are you youngest, oldest? I'm middle? the middle. So my brother was too young to do anything wrong and my sister was too old and too smart to do anything wrong. So it always had to be me. You know, the middle person was always the one. And what did your parents do? Well, my mother was just a homemaker and uh my father was at the time a flooring engineer, and uh, he did all kinds of flooring and stuff like that. And then later on in time, he became a chef, and he had a restaurant in Oceanside called Mario's. It's pretty successful. Uh, but I was always running around at that time. I was running around England and doing stuff like that. They never knew like where I was. They, they, they thought I was in town, and meanwhile, I was in Europe somewhere. You know? But uh, it was good. And you said you were in school kind of detached and a, a dreamer. Um, so were you, well, number one, I'm assuming that you weren't a great student if you were daydreaming all the time. <laughs> right. I wasn't. I wasn't. School was tough for me. Either, you know, I, I'd go to school and look at some, you know, this is why the low self-esteem, this is where it all starts. You know, you look at other women's clothes and, you know, they, they look like everything, you know, and I used to get my sister's. And so I used to start, you know, real feel, feel bad about that. But uh, the only thing I really liked in school was like dance band, you know, when I, because I was in band, you know, I started with the flute, but I didn't really like that. And then, you know, then I played big crash cymbals and then, you know, I the, you know, playing, you know, in the orchestra, you know, the drums. And that's when it started feeling a little bit more, a little bit more normal for me. Like I, my parents would, didn't really recognize or see that, that maybe I should have belonged in Juilliard or something like that. I should have belong, maybe belonged in a music school. You know, because I couldn't fit in. I just didn't fit in anywhere. No, but, you know, playing the drums and being in dance band and stuff, it started to feel a little bit more comfortable. How old were you when you did that? Like 12. I don't know. I had to look back at my scrapbook yeah. and get some dates on there. No, and when you started getting interested in, like, tried the flute, started playing in band, um, did your parents just think that that was kind of just like a fun extra curricular? I, yeah. I thought they thought it was just a fun extra thing. Like, I remember my, um, on Christmas, my, they bought me this big marching drum. You know, again, I'll show you that in my scalp. Um, that was like my first drum. And it's like, it had a strap on it, this big white thing. You know, so it was cute. It was nice. And then I used that drum in, in, in school. Again, it, the attention of it. You know, and I played the Yellow Rose of Texas standing up there with this big drum bigger than me. And that was, I don't even have to this day how I did that. But even in kindergarten, you know, I've talked about this before, like we were doing this music thing and tapping on the blocks and the teacher said, wow, who's doing that fabulous rhythm? And, you know, and I was like, you know, rapping them away. And I was a little kindergarten kid. And till this day, anyone, I can't remember a lot, believe me about my life, but I'll always remember that because she said, that was so great. Who was doing that great rhythm? You know, so the drums became like, a, hmm, this is get some attention with this stuff here, you know, maybe I should keep pursuing it. Hmm. And what was your, um, were you like 
a sociable kid, teenager? What was your peer group like, or what did you do for fun? I wasn't. I was kind of kind of withdrawn. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I did belong to black and white sorority, and I thought that was kind of cool, but I don't know. I had a hard time. Wait, what's school. black and white sorority? It was just like the colors of black and blue. It was a black and blue. It was name of it. I wish I could think of the name of this day. So I thought that was pretty cool at the time. But, you know, there's always the, the fast track kids and, you know, who always were like out there, you know. I don't know. Schools just wasn't a good time for me. I couldn't wait to get out of there, out of school. Me too. Can I identify I just, with that? <laughs> I think, I don't know, like barely 17, 16 or whatever. I just tell my parents I can't leave freaking out. Oh, did you drop out? I had to get out. Yeah. It was smothering me. I couldn't take it. And what were your, I mean, at that time, what were your kind of plans or expectations for your future? Well, I remember, you know, I can't tell this day, I don't remember who it was. I, we, they had a dance at the gym, and there was this band playing there. And I'm pretty sure until this day, I think there was like a female drummer. I think it was. Uh, I don't remember who, who it was or anything like that, but it's the band. They said, oh band. I should be in a band. Maybe I should play in a band. And that's what happened eventually. And I'm trying to think, sitting here talking to you, like I'm trying to put all these steps together because I did meet a producer at the time. His name was Johnny Lindy. And he came over to my house and he became pretty famous after a while with this red sparkle snare drum. And I said, oh, I got to have a red sparkle snare drum. Oh my God. And that led to so many different things. But I think they recommended me to this band, Devlin and the Premiers, who who needed a drummer, and I have to look back at my scrapbooks, because I'm not sure if I was playing with these other two guys before then, I mean, my life back then, I, I tried to put it all in order, it's very hard, so, I went to playing in this band, Devil in the Premieres, and I, it was the greatest thing, because I was like, the, the, the princess, the female drummer, you're talking about, what, 59 or 58, that was totally unheard of, but, it was great for me because I got all this attention. I said, ah, oh, you know, this is very, <laughs> this is more like it, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, they were great. I mean, we were a pretty good band. So I stayed with them for a while, and then one thing led to another. Um, did you start playing in bands uh, before you left high school and then kind of like no, I was just in, was march, in marching band for a while because I thought, oh, great, I could wear those white bucks and that really cool uniform, that would be great. You know, again, that would make me look cool. Yeah. So I did that. But the band thing was later on. Oh, okay. That was later on. I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to get out of school, too. So Devlin the Premieres was a pretty good band, and we auditioned, you know, to Sid Bernstein at a place in, in New York called The Round Table. And I've asked them that. I said, do you remember... You came to see, he, he said he didn't remember, he said it had been his office that came to see this band. And, my, you know, and they loved it. They said, oh, female drummer, you got to eat and rock in Miami, they'll eat this up, they'll love it. And I ran home, I couldn't wait to tell my parents, oh, I can go to Miami with, with, with the guys and it's going to be awesome. And they said, absolutely not, you're not going to, you're not going to, to Miami with a bunch of, and meanwhile, these guys are like my brothers. Yeah. Nobody had any interest in anybody, you know what I'm saying? They always took care of me. They never, I remember my first gig with them, I, I never drank. And I, had, I drank all this vodka and I was so sick, I wound up in a closet on the floor. And I remember them taking me home and telling my mother, oh no, she's just tired or something like that. And I was, the first time I think I ever got like wasted like that. So we were like, they were like my brothers. We, you know, they always, they only took care of me. and. and but they, you know, my parents wouldn't let me go. They said, you can't go. And then that, that's, what's, that's when things started after that. Did you leave home? I did. My parents, uh, I'm trying to uh, think. Oh, yeah. My parents said, you're not going to Miami. And I saw my father, they just bought me this car, a Ford XL500, this big white car with ice blue bucket seats, you know, rag top, they called them then with the white convertible top. Of course, I mean, I was paying for it, but they, they got it for me. He, my father pulled up in the driveway, and I'm, I'm going, perfect, this is my way out. I left them a note, I'm sorry, I can't go to Miami, I'm running away. So I jumped in the car, and I, I went to New York City to play at the Cinderella Club in Greenwich Village and with this guy, Nicky Lee Lane. 
and, I, and now here I am, this meek little scared of everything person, but I was like fighting, you know, I was like, I, I had to be a warrior, I had to like raise the sword, and I have to go to New York and follow my dreams. I, mean, I was scared to death, you know. So I wound up playing with Mickey in this club, the Cinderella Club, oh my God. You know, and they, they would advertise on the radio, please come home, and this and that and the other thing, and I remember one night we were playing, and Mickey said, oh, you have to come with me to Trudy Heller's around the corner. I want you to hear this singer, you know, and I'm like, oh, whatever, okay, you know, because I'm always like, like, whatever, I'm, I'm easy, you know. So we go around there, and then there's this singer on the stage, and, and I'm going to myself, this, well, this, this is when my life changed forever, that, that, that night, and I hear this voice, and I'm going, oh, this is crazy, this is wild. So it was Goldie, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, and the escorts. So I'm like, oh my God, she's so tough. You know, she had, you know, she's always like very Brooklyn, had a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. You know, and I'm like, oh, you know. But it was a life changing experience because now I knew what I was feeling all along. Because when I, you know, when I when I saw Goldie, it was like an instant connection, and I, that was it for me. You know, it was like, oh, this is really great. You know, and she was great. You know, so then he used to tell her, oh. I want you to hear this drummer that's working with me, you know, and she'd go like, oh, female drummer, you know, what's her name? Oh, Panna Bianco. And I'd go, what's her name? Zelkowitz. And I'd go, what kind of name is Zelkowitz? What kind of name is Panna Bianco? Then she came to see Mickey, and I was playing, you know, at the Cinderella Club, and then we would start talking, and I don't know. One thing led to another thing, and my father used to call me gingerbread all the time anyway. So, I don't know, we became Goldie and the, ginger Goldie and the Gingerbreads at that time. You know, when we started looking for musicians and got that band, and that was way long ago. What had happened to Devlin and the premieres? Well, they went on. Oh, okay. Did their thing to Miami, and then... Um, Back at that time, did people just kind of like... Um, it seemed like people borrowed other people's musicians a lot, or people played in, in more bands, me. I don't, well, it was I'm different back then. That. Everybody, I mean, you had a band. I mean, when we played at the the Peppermint Lounge, we played at the Peppermint Lounge and the Wagon Wheel Forty Fifth Street, and then they had the show bands, and not like from from Illinois or somewhere like that. A lot of countries from out west, and, uh, bands from out west. No, but everybody kind of had your own. Yeah, had a band. There wasn't mm. like that much switching around. It's like okay. it was the you know we, those garage bands. I mean, going to gingerbreads. All we did was rehearsed all day and we played. We worked very, we worked very hard at it. But it was different then. There was places to play. You know, you'd play six weeks here, it's five weeks there, and four weeks here, and then you'd do some colleges. You know, you throw all the shit in the car and pull you all it or whatever, and you're on your way. And that's how you made a. That's how we made a living. You know, and every it, there was bands. There was opportunity then. There was a club, one club to play after another club to play. And this is really interesting. So it sounds like. Being a girl drummer was a novelty, but it doesn't sound like it sounded like it was a pretty positive experience for you. You at know, the beginning. for me, it was a very positive experience because needing that, well, that you know, that such you know such low self esteem, and then getting all that attention, you know, with the guys, and you know, being a drummer, it was great. Mm -hmm. And even in Golden the Gingerbreads, you know, I don't really think that we, you know, had. I don't know, I think it was different for us because, first of all, we looked great. You know what I'm saying? And every and and whenever we'd play, all the guys would come, you know, mafioso the guys too, and they'd all come and sit in the front, like, you know, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, man, you know, look at these broads. I'm like, oh my God. And, and they would be ready to hear this, like, you know, watch us play, and then they're all ready to, like, cut us down. Mm -hmm. So they would go, and then, you know, go leave get out there with the tambourine and we'd start playing and they'd be like oh my god they're really good you know they're great and so we look great we sounded great so for us yeah it was an, always as a novelty when people come in they would they would say oh golden gingerbreads from new york american to a span or you know let female to a span or female this or female that but then these guys would come in ready to you know oh what does it feel like to be a female drummer i don't know what does it feel like to be a guy drummer you know but they, but we really pulled it off, and we never really, I think, went through that that thing there because mm -hmm. we held our own. I mean, guys, they would go out of their way to try to help me, you know, move my drums around. And I, I remember so many times, like, I have these big black, not like today, everything's on wheels, you know, I have the big black heavy trap case. I mean, I was very strong, you know, and I always was. And they'd go to me, oh, 
can I help you pick up that trap case and put it in the car? I go, no, it's really very heavy. I don't want you to hurt yourself. You know, and they go, oh, no, 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 I insist. So I'd step aside and they'd go, Jesus Christ, this thing weighs a ton. I go, yes, I know, step aside. And I'd put it in the car myself. But they don't, they got a kick at it. We used to play in Vegas. I remember they, Louis Prima was playing at the time. And we were playing in the lounge and, and all of his band would come in and I'd be like, oh my God, look at these guys, they have these musicians. And they would sit on my side because I used to wear a skirt with fishnet stockings and stuff like that. You know, look all like Gina Lola Bridget and everything. And they would come and like, they would just watch, but they were in awe of it, you know? And they couldn't believe that, oh my God, she's a female drummer. But she really could play. She plays really good, you know, and really hard. So people were just getting over it all the time, you know, because they couldn't believe that there could be three women up there, you know, playing instruments and yet that, you know, goalie, you know, she's just very, very funny, actually. She could have been a great comedian. So for us, you know, we got, we had a lot of opportunity, you know, going to England, you know, with the Stones and stuff like that. We did a lot of stuff. Um, well, how, how long were you playing before you got signed to DECA and then Atlantic? <sighs> Did it, it seemed like it happened pretty quickly, but that could just be in the bio. You bios. know what? Um, again, let me think. When we first, the, the Golden Gingerbread, when we first had, we had a different, we had Carol Sheen and Marsha, Marsha Meltzer and me and Goldie. We had that band and first before we were signed to anybody. And we played, oh God, I have to think of all this now. We went to Germany to, for, to play for... Uh, where did we play? Chubby Checker. Who else was it? Oh, God, so many. I'll show you that. I will have to go through some of that stuff. Okay. And I don't believe we were signed yet, but I get, when you're, you're going to talk to, uh, to Goldie anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I was just more wondering what the that's what progression sure. was, was like or how quick well, it was. Well, what happened was when we, we lost, I think Marsha left, and we didn't have Carol then. Mm -hmm. And we came back from Germany all full of ourselves with our black leather pants and our long leather coats. And like, you too can have leather pants if you join Goldie and the Gingerbreads, you know. So we heard about this carol, this singer carol, playing at, uh, uh, oh God, with the uh, little, uh, oh, what was his name? God, not, uh, oh, it's a famous club, Tiny Tim. Mm -hmm. And he was always playing at this club. What the hell was it called? Oh, I'll remember probably later. And we heard this, you know, Carol, you know, this girl singing, she played rhythm guitar, she had this big voice, and I'm saying to myself, boy, she's the one. We gotta get this girl. So we went up, oh, we know we're going to gingerbreads, and you two can have leather pants, and we just came back from Germany. You wanna join our band? And she said, no. Um, so we're like, all right, whatever. So, but curiosity got the best of her, and she came to see us. And it, um, I don't know if it was Trudy Hellers or the headliner. And she sat in with us and never left. Mm. And then we had Carol, and I, you know, that was, you know, she was like the fourth member, you know, it was great. Then we had, was Margo, then it was Margo, myself, Goldie, and that was, that became the, the band. Um, and then, that's what I'm trying to think, we weren't even together a year when we got Carol, and then Margo was first after Carol Sheen, and then Carol, and then, she, we went to Associated Booking, and, and then that's right around the time we got that deal. Mm -hmm. um, how did you afford to do things like go to Germany to tour? Well, again, we were always working, and the eight, when we got booked into those places, our expenses were paid. You know, they'd have to pay the airfare and things like that. Like I said, it was different then. That doesn't happen today. You know, when we, when we were playing at the wagon wheel on 45th Street, and the, you know, we had played a party for Jane Holzer, a very big fashion model. And Keith Richards had come to that party. And he says that he is the one that told Alan Price from the Animals about Golden Gingerbread. So he's like the first one to discover us, you know. And then that's when the Rolling Stones came to, came to America. So then, so, you know, we played like kind of a little reception party you know, Mary Jane Holmes and all these people came and he came and and one thing led to another and then we were playing at the headline, the wagon wheel on 45th Street and the animals had House of the Rising Sun and they came to New York and they were playing at the Paramount right at the end of the street. So they wanted to check out the New York music scene so they came 
up to 45th Street to the Petment Lounge, and they heard this band outside of the wagon wheel. They thought it was some kind of blues, you know, band or whatever. And they came in and they dropped dead and couldn't believe it was Goldie and the Gingerbreads. And they knew right off the bat, oh, we have to take them to England. Yeah. You know, so that was another story in itself, you know, getting to England and, you know, going to Europe. We went on the Mauritania and we didn't have good a good cabin, so we played up on the ship, you know, to get, move up. I mean, when I went to my room, it was all my drums were in there, there was like no room for me. So we said, oh, we gotta do something about this. So we, you know, we started playing and, you know, get, we were just incredible. We did things that back in that day, you wouldn't find a band, a, a female band doing any of the stuff that we did, but we did it to persevere. We did it, we know, you know, it's what we had to do. You know, we did it 24 seven, we worked at it. Nothing came easy. We rehearsed all day, played all night. You know, we went to England, opened up for the Stones, you know, the Kinks and the Yardbirds, all these bands. And, you know, that's when we had that, that record catching in a heartbeat. Hmm. Were, were you living in New York at the time? I was living, I, I did live with Goldie for a while, and I think it was Brooklyn. I remember when I first did that. And she said, oh, you, you, you can stay with me. You ran away, and, and you, do you have much? And I said, no, I don't have too much stuff. I, I had a shoe, I had like 50 pairs of shoes, and I had a monkey, a woolly monkey, Beaumont. She couldn't believe it. She said, you have a monkey? And I brought this monkey to the house. You know, oh, you had, had a live monkey. I had a live monkey, a woolly monkey. And those are other stories. <laughs> I, I was so freaking insane. I mean, what can I tell you? So I brought this monkey, and she couldn't believe she, I had. I, I she said, "Oh my God!" And I had shoes, yeah. and, and, and this monkey. Oh yeah, yeah. So it was, it was incredible. <laughs> that these are all one yeah. story with another story. No, I just can't. Oh, Gen <laughs> Genya tells <laughs> Goldie. She Genya, She te she tells great stories about Beaumont. Yeah. You <laughs> tell me about Beaumont the monkey. <laughs> oh, he used to like hang on her neck, and but he's like a little, yeah. he's a little pervert. This little monkey, <laughs> <laughs> and he used to sit and hang on her and, and look at her buttons and go. <laughs> it's sick. But anyway, he was uh, uh, Beaumont the Woolly Monkey. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, all right, I don't know how to transition from monkey. <laughs> if you want to start and stop this? So just oh yeah, probably. So we'll, do you need a drink or anything? No, I'm good. I can You're okay. Yeah. How about you? You want? You like no, seltzer? I have mine. I'm fine. Okay. I should have reviewed yeah. all my my scraps. Oh wait, it's this. I should have reviewed yeah. my oh, scrapbooks. Oh no, it's okay. Hmm. I should have reviewed my scrapbooks. No, it's all right. I have I have a picture of a Beaumont in there. Where did you get a pet monkey? Oh, I'm so freaking sick. Because I don't know, I'm a lunatic. It, it, I was still living at home, and I went to the pet store, and I saw this cute little monkey. I guess I wanted a friend, and I got this monkey. And my oh, my God. I I got it. You know, it's very hard to. Put all those times together. First, I got the monkey, and I, that was when I was living home. And then I ran away after. I, it's just. Did you bring the monkey with you when you ran away? No, you left the monkey with your. Well, parents. I got because well because I had it. I didn't know where I was even going. <laughs> I didn't know where, even where I was going to live at that time. So, oh my god. Um, I was wondering, once you started playing and making a name for yourselves. Did your parents come to accept that you were a musician, or were they no. like, ha no, never? Well, what happened was, they became like my family. It was like golden gingerbreads, like I would have took a bullet, you know what I'm saying? It was like, no, that's, that, this is like, they like to replace all that for me. Mm -hmm. So when, when I was being involved in that band, it was like being involved, not any much different than a dysfunctional family. It was felt, really felt like a family to me. They were like my sisters. And I just, you know, I said, oh, I think I, I found where I belong type of thing. So everything is, I take in everything. You know, it's like very heavy for me to do this to when I do things. And so that began, that that was like greater than anything. You know, it was like, oh, man, we're traveling all around. We're doing this, we're doing that. You know, I really felt like, oh, you know, now I'm really doing something. So I didn't feel that way at home at all. Um, and... So you were the first all-girl band signed to a major label, and you toured with Rolling Stones, Animals. Um, can you just kind of 
it's not really a specific question, but but if you could talk about maybe how th I'm assuming things changed when you're just kind of um, taking care of yourselves and doing these tours, and then you get signed to a major label and you're kind of like managed and just what what it was like to tour and to record how maybe the band dynamics changed or hmm. well I mean it, it definitely became more exciting because I don't know if it's good or bad when the when the when, the, when you're just playing to make a living then all of a sudden uh, it's a record now you want to hit and you start thinking of music in a different way Back when we did, you know, you know, in my, in my time, it was all cover music. You know, we used to do "Be My Baby," and half the people used to think it was us instead of the Ronettes that recorded that song. So, I don't know. I think once you start to play an instrument and look to make it, is when it's all over. In in, in my view, so I mean, it was exciting recording, and of course, oh, I got to try to remember all this stuff. I mean, when we, rec I mean, traveling with the Stones and everything, it was grueling. It was hard. We had this shitty little van, you know, and we drove around in the van. But, but it's exciting to be, but to be an opening act for somebody like the Rolling Stones was no easy feat. If you would think to go to England and be their opening act, it was really some experience. But we, you know, we pulled it off, and they, they were very good to us. You know, I mean, I remember one day I was playing, and I, I was playing, and then all of a sudden I was playing, and then I was playing, and I was almost off my drum seat. Because they played this joke on me and tied a rope onto my drum seat and were pulling me away from the drums. <laughs> so they would do crazy, quirky things and stuff like that. And all that was fun and all that was great. And I remember Brian Jones, he got whacked by a fan with something on his head. And I used to like, you know, like, oh, poor Brian. And I used to, you know, I got along with him pretty good. And I used to like help him. And he, they used to say, oh, you know, we'll send that back to America in the teeny magazines. You know, Ginger from Golden Gingerbreads and Brian are an item. And it wasn't true. So you can't beat that kind of excitement. But when you're living it, you're not really realizing. I mean, I can't imagine this day if I had a camera, like we have the technology today. I would have footage, the most unbelievable footage and pictures and things that you could ever imagine, that the things that we did and the people we travel with. But, you know, we didn't. So, but I don't know. Yeah, we were together almost five years, and near the end, I mean, we had Can't You Hear My Heartbeat, and Mickey Most and Michael Jeffries were in a some kind of feud. I don't know what. Mike says, he is, he Can't You Hear My Heartbeat. Atlantic Records says, you're going to finally have a hit in America. And we're all, ooh, thank God. And then Mickey Miss says, no, you can't have the song. I'm giving it to Hermits Hermits. Hermits Hermits put it out in America. Ahmed Erdogan says, they got the hit. They're putting it out. I'm sorry. You know, we can't put out two can't hear my heartbeats yeah. and that was kind of like near the end you know so we didn't we got our hit in England but we didn't get it in America so I mean the pressure started mounting a little bit and stuff like that and I I don't know for some reason and Goldie I think looked to become a single for yeah, there's you know emotional reasons this reason or that reason you know the, when the band maybe became kind of like changing and then that was the end of that, of almost five, six years. And I had to leave England. And I left by myself. And that was a horrible experience. And I got a big giant pan that I got from Den Dusty Springfield to keep me company on the plane. And so I a went panda? through all this. Huh? A panda? Yeah, big stuffed panda. Bear. Oh, stuffed. So, okay. Well, I don't know. I was a monkey. I was <laughs> oh, like, a monkey, a panda. Wait, you, know, <laughs> you know, to keep me company on the plane. And that, and that, you know, so after all that, you know, you know, all the. All that we experienced and all that we did, you know, who knows? You know, going to England was a great thing and, you know, getting the record and all that, but who knows? I don't know. When you were on uh, the major label and this is just going back a little bit, like, but like the recording process, did you play all of the instruments yes, on the we records? Did. Yeah. We, we played everything. All through in England we played everything. And near the end they were coming up with these big songs. And then they started saying we got to add and replace. And to me, you know, that's the end. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that, I mean, I think you kind of insinuated it, but the, the pressure put on you from a major label to deliver a hit song, um, would you say that that was like a big 
It always the is. catalyst of the you know the kind of dissolution. Of it, the it always band. is because it's like anything. It's like a, a, you write a book and then they want your next book. Or they want your next hit. You know they want your next record. You know because record companies, which they had then, a thing called a record company, they give you an advance. You know, and you go out there and you, you try to get that hit. I mean, you're not really useful to anybody without a hit mm -hmm. or something. Then they had, I think, EPs or like a four little thing, yeah. uh, four songs. So yeah, all the pressure, all that does, it, it becomes just a great pressure. And I get, you're not out there innocently playing, you know, the next gig and the next gig and everything's all, you know, you're still like, you know, you're still struggling, you're still in your car driving 20 million hours, you're tired and falling asleep at the wheel practically. I remember one time we were driving, I, I don't know, we were always, I don't know, Pittsburgh, someplace like Oshkosh, we actually played in a place called Oshkosh, and Goldie had her big Pontiac and she was driving and I don't know what happened if she was full. She thought she was going to hit a pillar, like a bridge. Yeah. She opened the door and told everybody to jump. She literally rolled out of this car. And we're all like this in the car with nobody driving, you know. And I'm, going, and I'm screaming, oh, my God, Goldie, 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 what happened to you? She, she disappeared, right out, rolled right out the door. And, and now to when this, you can't even believe this could happen, but it did. And so... We were like the team to the band, excuse me, you know, the band. So, so uh, we was, Carol was in the, I, I, I hit the brake, Carol jumped up, and she stayed at the car, and we stopped it from hitting, you know, from, from hitting anything. And then there's Goldie running like a half a mile down the road with her hair, with that red hair, <laughs> up in the wind, you know, thinking that, you know, she, she panicked and jumped out of the car because she could have been killed. I mean, those were the times. I mean, those were amazing, amazing times. You know, the <laughs> craziness like that, the things we did in the, you know, the crappy dressing rooms and, you know, traveling in, in the car, all that. It's your, you, you can't even imagine that experience, say, because it doesn't happen anymore. But then, you know, the, those pressures come with the, you got to hit your record companies and it lo you lose some of that. And Did then, the record company pay you? Like, were you able to support yourselves while you were signed? Yeah, well, we were in England. We barely got by. I mean, we, we, we you know, we, we made some money, you know, the record companies. But we, we made a living doing playing, but nothing really, yeah. you know, like, oh, like, let's go move to Bel Air, you know. And we got hit record now, and let's go to Hollywood. And, you know, it, it was, never got to that point. I mean, the adventures are priceless. Um, and what did you, like, was it a surprise to you when, when the band actually broke up? That was five, six years of your life. And what did you plan on doing? Well, I, I was devastated because, I mean, the emotional tie that I had to that band was beyond anything. So I, but being strong and being a little trooper, you know, whether I, you know, I shut myself down or whatever I did, I knew I had to survive. So, I mean, I was hurt in a lot of, a lot of ways that no one asked me to stay because then Margot and Carol got some band and started writing and getting that she's off, going to go be a single. And I'm like, well, what about me? You know what I'm saying? So I felt like after all that, the family, the whole thing, and all that love that I had, especially for Goldie, what, you know, that's it. No, no great words, no great nothing, no. And I found myself on a plane going back to Valley Stream, Long Island, by myself. And it, but it just so happens it was set up for me through, I don't know, I shouldn't say who, but to be a Playboy Bunny in Hollywood, right? So I said, all right, I'm going to go to Hollywood. I'm going to be a Playboy Bunny. <laughs> so I'm like... So I go all the way back to Valley Stream, and there I am. And then my 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 little my little monkey had died, and my father, you know, buried him and everything. And I'm sitting there after this English opening act, all this stuff. I barely had any money to get out of England to come back to New York. I stayed there for a while. Now I'm going to California because now I'm going to be a Playboy Bunny at the Playboy Club. And I'm like, all right, well. This is how life is. This is what happens. So then I go there. Um, thank God for Dusty Springfield. She helped me out with um, this guy, Peppy, a friend of hers. And she said, oh, you, go meet, you can meet up with Peppy, and he'll take you around, and he'll, he'll help you, you know. So I'm like, all right. So now I, get, I remember 
in this hotel the first night I'm in, in, in Hollywood and it was raining and it was cold. And I said, did I not be in Mickey Lee Lane the first night I played when I ran away from home? Was it not raining and cold and damp? And I said, here I am in Hollywood, California and I'm freezing, it's cold and damp and I'm in this motel. That is a feeling that, I don't know, God must have given me the strength. I don't know how I endured it, I'll tell you. And I'm thinking, all right, I just got to keep it together to go to the Playboy Club and everything will be fine, you know. So after a while, I started running out, running out of money. You know, Peppy said, I, I don't know how you could keep doing this. You might have to go find, and I think I did find an apartment. Um, but then someone told me about the Hollywood Studio Club. And I said, oh, what's that? You know, the Hollywood Studio Club? I'm not going to go there. I can't stay with strange people. I don't know any of those people that stay there, all those women, and I'll be all by myself, and I don't know anybody. Because, again, I'm extremely shy, never talked or anything, you know, to anybody. And, it, and so I, I said, I have no choice. I'm going to have to go there. Because I, I know I was running out of money, and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the place called the Hollywood Studio Club. Places like where Marilyn Monroe stayed, Elizabeth mm -hmm. Taylor, and incredible. And that's a, that's another another chapter, and and then after a while, you know, I said, oh, it's not so bad. You know, I can't wait till I'm here long enough and I can have my own room and things like that. So I had to get ready to go over to the Playboy Club, you know, to do to do that. And I go there and and I go, oh hi, you know, I'm Ginger, and I was sent by. So and so to be a Playboy bunny. So she goes, All right. She said, Why don't you just hang around the recreational area? She said, You've got to lose a little weight to get into a bunny suit. And I actually had a picture of me in a bunny suit and it got lost somewhere. I wish I today. Oh. <laughs> I said, oh, Okay, I can lose some weight to, you know, to be, you know, Playboy bunny, whatever. You know? And I'm like, Oh my God, there's something wrong with me. So, so I wound up making friends at the Hollywood Studio Club, you know, and I met some musicians and things like that. And after a while, and they were very nice to me at the Playboy. You know, I remember once I had to go see Demita Joe at the time. I don't know if you even know who she is. Mm -hmm. Back then, she was pretty successful. And I'd have to sit with these guys just to keep... They were all like gentlemen. No one ever... You know, it's like, God, I'm telling you. And they would start talking to me about their mothers, about this, about that. And I'm going like, this is a story of my life. Why do people just like to sit and talk to me? And I'm sitting, I'm like, okay. That, you know, and I remember this guy. I, I mean, they were always... His money go take the care of home. Never stepped out of line. Never would, would, would just tell me these stories about this, that, and the other thing. So after a while, I'm like, oh boy, what am I doing? You know. But then I went back to the Hollywood Studio Club, and then, like I said, I started making friends. And then I met the, uh, some musicians, and I said, oh man, you know. And then I found and I got another band, a little band together called um, the Ginger Group. You know, and I, you know, play up in the mountains, and I started getting comfortable in Hollywood. And I said, oh, this is, this fits good. You know, I started settling down. I said, oh, I had a little band. Life is great again, and that type of thing. And then I get a phone call. Oh, we're going to get back together again, come back to New York. Goldie and the Gingerbreads? Yeah. So I did, and we didn't. And so it goes on from there. It just goes on and on and on. I just have a couple quite because I've never I did was not familiar with these places. So the the Hollywood Studio Club, Studio Club was apartments for yeah, it's like a big building. Artists. I think it still stands today actually, and um, it's like it's very you know look you know it not like a building from New York. It, I, I have pictures of it. Um, and it had a big main room with couches and very, you know, the palm trees, very nice, mm. beautiful. And then you go up these staircases and they had single rooms and they had, you know, maybe with two or three people stayed in another room, you know, with, with the staircase, with, you know, with the, like the balcony and everything. It was very nice. And, and actresses would go to, would go stay there while they're trying to film or make it in Hollywood, you know. Mm. And they would all come to the Hollywood Studio Club and stay there. And then, you know, my friend Coral called me the other day, actually. We were talking about the Hollywood Studio Club because she's going to be doing, uh, like, a book on it. Yeah. And the people that stay there. So she wanted to talk to me about, you know, what it was like, how I was there, how, how, how intriguing I was. And I'm like, me? <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And she's reminding me of all the people that, you know, she's that. She says, don't you remember Farrah Fawcett was staying there with us? And, and I, I'm like, who? What? <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah. But um, it was pretty amazing. 
So you got like comfortable there and you made friends and you started a band and you were I was ready for my Carolina life. Carolina. Oh, see, <laughs> thinking. I was ready for my, yeah, my California life. Okay. And you got a call from Kenya? I, I think that, it was Margo. Okay. I have to, I can't remember who called me and just said, we're going to get back together again and come back to New York. And I did. Was this very, like, how long had you been broken I up? I think I had point? already been at, I think I had already, it's been, was months. Oh, Maybe okay. even, it could have been, is it a year? I'm not sure. It seems like an eternity. But all I know is I packed everything up. And, went. and then it just didn't happen anyway, or? No. Oh, okay. We had a whole completely different kind of band. Yeah. No, it didn't. And then, I don't know, one thing led to another. And then around the meeting, then, uh, you know, little bands in between with this one and that one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I was wondering what happened between Goldie and the Gingerbreads and, and Isis. Was that like... Oh, I, well, Isis... Eight, is, eight years, ten years? Oh, well, in between. Isis was like 73, 72. Yeah. Goldie and the Gingerbreads was really... Again, when I look at my scrapbook, there's a date when we ended. It was 64, 65. Oh, was that 65. early? Okay. Yeah. And then... You know, then you try, you know, with me, Margo, and Carol, and then, you know, uh, then I, I, Earl, oh, God, I, it, that was a little blurry. Yeah. It was just a constant trying to form okay. new bands and put different ideas together and thoughts. And then what happened was, um, just jumping a little further to get to the ISIS thing, um, Carol, myself, Margo, and a keyboard player, Tracy Robbins, we had a band called Blythe Spirit. So we'd play clubs and we did, you know, we did all this, this different stuff. And we had a gig at a place called Brugere's in Long Island. So then, I mean, I was still a little Miss Perfect then, you know, with the eyelashes and, the, you know, everything had to have it. I had to be perfect and everything. I, I was still a little like, like that. And so we, we had this gig at Brugere's on Long Island. So we go out there, and it it's raining again. <laughs> so now it's raining, and we set we set up, and some friends came to see us, and they said we're going to go down the road and get some food or something or whatever. And it was a very stormy night, and it was lightning and thunder. And from what I remember, because Mark had to remind me, the guy was going to cook, and you turn the gas on to make. I said I was brought down by a hamburger. And the club exploded to the ground. The stage went across a four-lane highway, and Tracy Robbins was blown down into the basement, along with Margot and Carol, and I was blown through the building out to the parking lot. <laughs> right off my drum seat. Boom! I was gone. It, it was just like a flash and nothing. So then I'm out there walking around like, you know, always trending and always hide, hide my emotions to me mind because I'm in shock. Walking around and everyone's all running around. Oh my God! Again, they're forgetting about me because I'm still walking around. But but Tracy was in the basement, and she almost died because nobody wanted to get her out. Actually, a, a guy passing by went down the basement and got her out. She had burns. It took forever for her to heal. Mm. And Margo had a fractured pelvis. She went right down on her Hammond B3. And Carol broke her knee. And I'm blown out of the building. And then after a while, they got to bring to the hospital. They go, where is Ginger? <laughs> where, what happened to her? Where is she? They go, oh, no, she's walking around out there somewhere. So days later, they put me in the hospital. Because I'm walking around with, like, the you know, at, and then we're all in the hospital, and I would escape to go to the other hospital to see Carol, you know, and see how she's doing. And it was insanity. But long story short, Carol came out of the hospital. They never got her off a demo or anything like that. This is this is another chapter. This is just a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, we're waiting for Tracy to recover. So Carol and I started hanging out at all these different parties. And, of course drugs are involved there's no you know and we'd sit there and and she picked up this book called the book of the book of truth or the voice of osiris and then she started reading about the egyptian mythologies and 
the reasoning of how they think and this and that and why this and why that and you can so she really got she was really into it so a lot of trials and tribulations around that time too when we went to Florida and stuff like that but long story short eventually down the road it's like ISIS came out of the ashes of that explosion I no longer was Miss Perfect Ginger I totally was left in that freaking explosion I came out a whole different other person so now I said to Carol one day, wow, what a great name for a band. We should call, get a new band and call it ISIS. This is after I'm driving a cab in New York. We're all screwed up, forget it, in plain English. I mean, I don't even, it's not my place to say some of the stuff that went on back then. It just was unbelievable. So Carol and I put together that band ISIS with nothing, had nothing, and went to Boot Decca Records and said, oh, I mean Buddha, mm -hmm. and said, we have the greatest band called ISIS in Europe, blah, blah, blah. and they said you do. We didn't. Then we came back and we were looking. We got horn, you know, she went, the horn section, and we got this one, and we got that one, and that's actually the first one that's up there in that in that picture up there. Oh yeah. And uh, with Liberty, and we started putting together this band called ISIS, and then of course one thing led to another, and we finally got the right set of musicians, and then we became we became ISIS, and you know and. We were incredible. There's just no doubt about it. But we were also out there. Like, this is our thing and we're doing it. We don't care what anyone says. And we are who we are. And we're going to be who we're going to be. And we write songs according to, like, what we're feeling. And everyone has to, you know, because it was more like a rock. Uh, rock. Mm -hmm. I know, you, you've heard this stuff, yeah. right? Everyone pitches in with their own thing. And, and here, we, here we are so screwed up from that accident. And but yet and being evicted, thrown on the street, you name it. But we persevered with that band and got it to such a point. Then we opened in America for you know three dog night and all these you name it. We were like it, Golden Ginger Buzz in England. ISIS was here. I mean, as, we were messed up, but you know, look what we accomplished. You, know, you can imagine. And I know, thought that was all just. <laughs> I thought that was the kind of political culture and climate. At the time, I had no, I assumed that that whole band was like, uh, not s straight in a straight gay way, but straight, like no drugs, no drinking, and just Total like opposite. hardcore feminist. <laughs> Total opposite. It was like, I'm, to know. I, I'm going to be who I'm going to be, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, gay, straight, or whether you don't like it, it's too freaking bad. But... We did amazing things. So we did Don. We did Dick Clark TV show. Don Don Kirshner rocked. I, I have a tape of that actually. TV show. Um, we did so much stuff, and screwed up. We did that stuff. So could you imagine if we weren't? What we what we probably, maybe that band would have cut through everything and done something. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's the it's the fame thing. Oh, we got to make it, we're going to get hit. And we got the album. Uh, if we were the first or the second, to, you know, we get this, this thing's going on. Oh, we were the first to get a major record deal. We were the first to get the album. I don't know. But we got the album deal, and we did the album. We had like three, and we did, we do an album at a time when there was a final show. We'd be playing at the Coliseum in, in, in these big, huge venues with no album to sell because there was a vinyl shortage. I mean, come on. These things, <laughs> I, I mean... You know, like on the gingerbreads, we could have had a hit, but Herman got it. Yeah. So for some reason, through the through this whole experience, you know, and Goalie and the gingerbreads and ISIS were huge, but yet we we couldn't break through. Mm. You know, we broke down a lot of barriers. We did a lot of stuff. We we recreated a lot of history. We did all kinds of things, but we really never got the the record. Yeah. or the right notoriety or what or whatever well I, and I read something uh, an interview with Carol McDonald who was she was out at the time right, yes during she ISIS could care less. Yeah. yeah but she said that she felt like maybe that contributed to the band not being as commercially yes. successful it hurt, it, it hurt the band yeah well because I don't know. I mean, you would have thought by that time. I mean, look what's going on today. There's still today. Oh, you can't. Oh, you should be. I, I mean, I can't even get over that today. It's 2018, and they're still bickering about yeah. these things. 
back, you know, back in the 70s, you know, I mean, people really weren't ready either, I, I guess. I mean, when we played some places in Florida where they thought we were like, like a blasphemy, like, oh my God, uh, you know, some of those Bible Belt places, the ISIS, it was like, oh, it, it was like, you might as well, the demon from hell itself just came to play at the club tonight. I remember one day, my my father and my brother came to see this this club, and I think words were. Sh and my, I I I'm looking down, and my 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 father and my brother are fist fighting, uh, in the audience because someone made a crack. I'm like, what the hell? But I mean, look at that band. I mean, just think of it, and look at that. I mean, Herb Herb Apple came to see us one night at Trudy Heller's, and he like he left. He couldn't even handle it. Hmm. So that band was, it, it, I mean, we were in People Magazine, I believe the second issue or the third issue, you know, I have to show you that. You know, it was like, you know, girls, you know, searching for stardom and stuff like that. And then, of course, there was always negative reviews. I mean, when you want to have a voice, like, it's all right to want to have a voice, but maybe the way we went about doing it, or maybe the way Carol was, or maybe, you know, being like not caring about what you think, what we are, what we do, mm -hmm. it was probably, it didn't help. Yeah. But with all that, we did all that. We did all those TV shows, we did all those major tours, you know, opening for the Beach Boys and, and for Three Dog Night and, and Leon Russell and you name it. And then like with Golden Gingerbreads, well look at all we did. And we were almost like little sweet innocent things most of the time, you know what I'm saying? And yet, we didn't break through. Mm. So, I guess it's a lot of different things. You know, I don't know, you know, if I would have gotten the success that we were looking for in ISIS, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. So I guess God knows better than we do. Things don't happen, but you know, you don't want to hear that when it's happening to you right then and there. Oh, things happen for a reason. What is the reason? What is happening? Why is why is it happening? Why can't I have this band? Or why can't why can't we get that record? Or why can't we do this? Or why can't we do that? So, you know, by the time the 80s rolled around, uh, you know, ISIS was coming. I don't know. I, I was again out of ISIS and in, I remember watching it from some rehab somewhere, ISIS, on, on, you know, they re finally ran our, our TV show. And then Carol had many, many musicians after that. It used to be like, a, after a while, like, oh my God, Carol blew through 60 musicians. Because... So did you leave the... Eventually, band? well, kind of, sort of. I kind of like, I feel, I, feel, I feel like, in Golden Gingerbreads, I feel like no one fought for me. And in ISIS, I felt I wound up in the same place at the end. And... You really have to fight for yourself. So that's what I, I think, you know, that's, if, if that's my message or if that's my story, I don't know. So, you know, you can question it and think about it and, my God, how can you have done all this and how can you have done all that and what happened? And this, you know, your fault, comp record company's fault, timing. So I, I always say, like, little young musicians, play, play for the love of playing and don't worry about the rest. Just do it because you want to do it. Know you're going to struggle through it. You know, don't care about what anyone else plays like or sounds like. Just, you know, be yourself and play your instrument. And if it naturally takes you to where you got to go, then that's awesome. But I think as soon as you live to, like, to live to make it, live for the success. Like in the, in the Book of Truth, it says, you, if you work hard and you earn wealth, or you earn success or whatever it is, there's nothing wrong in that. But if you live to do it for that reason, if you live to be famous, mm -hmm. if you live to make money, if that's why you're doing it, it's not gonna it's not the right way of doing things, you know? So we innocently never really lived to have a hit record. We didn't live to be famous. But by, but but in the 60s, what we accomplished, or well, myself as, as a drummer back in the time, I mean, there was Phyllis Bethany, and they had, there was, there's, you know, but being in that time period, like a rock drummer, or being like mm -hmm. I was, was really unheard of. 
you know, so it was unique and special in a way. And then to find a combination of three, you know, the four women who clicked and we made that magic happen, you know, and then it didn't happen. And then there's all the in-betweens of bands and all the, you know, still trying and still trying and still trying to get that deal to get that record or to just get out there and play music to make a living so you don't have to take a, a, a day job. And then getting blown up in the club and then becoming <laughs> ISIS, I mean, and then go through all that, you know, being evicted, being this, being that, because you're so messed up, you know, but yet accomplish all that. But yet still, are you a household mate? No. We talked a little bit on the phone just about, that, well, that was the early 80s, mid 80s, that it ISIS officially... ISIS was 70s. Oh, ISIS was 70s, but like what... Um, it, it, you weren't playing with them. ISIS was like 75, 76. I mean, the first ISIS album, I think, was 75. They went on to do three or four other items. Actually, ISIS is the band that went to New Orleans that when Alan Toussaint, again, Alan Toussaint wanted to produce ISIS. Mm -hmm. So... He had a whole different sound that he was trying to create. Again, why? Take what we already are, take what we already have, and if you want to, you know, whatever, simplify it a little or, I, I, you know, sh reshape it a little bit. But no, it was a whole completely different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That was near the end of ISIS. By the, and Alan Toussaint, and he was, he, he made me crazy. I mean, he was so mean. I mean, this he had this one beat that he wanted in a specific song. Um, I know what, if, which one it is if I see it on the album. He was telling me. And he made me so nervous, and I wasn't getting it, you know. And he was like so, I was like this. But then Ellen, the trumpet player, she said, give me five minutes. She sat with me for five minutes and said, this is what, this is what he's looking for. And she explained that beat to me, and I got it in two seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Already then, by the end, you know, I'm going to New Orleans, it's great, and Tucson, this is, you know, big thing, but it's like near the end of Golden Gingerbreads, when you want to try, try to change the sound or change the thing, or, mm -hmm. I don't know. So that's when, when June tells that story that she was trying to disappear and then someone called her to come to New Orleans and play guitar, you know, and she, was, she came down and she heard all those great stories and stuff. And that was, by then, I, near the, after that, it was... Yeah. It was over. And then what did you do? Did you still want to play music well, or form another band? Or I had to go through that period of getting my act together. Oh, yeah, because that 30 years ago. So you did that right after ISIS. So, again, like I feel like no one fought for me because I, I tried to go into a rehab and get my act together. And at that time, then Margot came into the band and I remember everybody thought they maybe couldn't talk to me. I don't know what it was. And then Carol should. And that's what I'm saying. I feel like nobody fought hard enough for me to come back into that band. But you know what? It never lasted after that anyway because I feel like the whole karmic thing of it was, it was finished. You know what I'm saying? Because it couldn't go on to become anything, especially like that. So maybe that's why things end, because they have to be right and purposeful. And the, out, the final outcome has to be something useful or something that could be passed on or something through that means you can do something for someone else or a cause of something else. So to me, I tell myself these things that that's why maybe those things ended where they ended. Because in any outcome, they would have been terrible. And I know it would have been terrible for me. If ISIS would have had that success, I'd be dead. You know what I'm saying? Because my, my way of thinking and everything that was going on in my head wasn't good. So I tried to get my act together, and, and by then ISIS kind of moved on and went their, their, their own way. And so through the 80s, you know, trying to stand on my own two feet and find my life again, find myself again, that was like the end of it because 
once you start getting that far away from it, you stop. Like everybody kept going. Then you try to, now the times are changing and everything is different. And then you try to get back into it. You know, I, I just couldn't find my way back. You know, then I wound up over there, <laughs> you know, looking for jobs. And then 18 years ago, I wound up at the Home Depot. I wound up up here. And now I'm feeling that I have to do this again. You know, I have to find my way back into it. So you haven't done music at all no. since the 80s? Like, nope. You did the, there was a Goldie and the Gingerbreads reunion. Did you, yeah. you were involved I was with there, that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there was like a couple ISIS of things. ISIS reunion, right? There was some, I uh, think there was an ISIS reunion. The bottom reunion. line, it was terrible. 2001. It was terrible. Oh, it was? I mean, because it wasn't our horn section. Oh. And it wasn't, I don't know. It just, yeah. some things I guess you just have to leave. Go, let yep. it go. Look at me telling her, oh, you gotta let things go. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Well, did you, I mean, so when, so you went to rehab, got cleaned up, got a job, moved out here. Um, did you miss playing music? Like, is being a musician a part of your identity at this point? If you're not doing it, do you feel like something's missing? Well, people, yeah, at times I do. This is very tough, you know, because like I said, the Red Sparkle Snare Drum was an emotional thing for me as seen as a way out, trying to find myself, a way of getting attention, a way of, so a lot, I know a lot of, so I'm different than a lot of other musicians. I'm sure there are, there are musicians that have this passion. They just never stop playing, never stop playing, never stop playing. Like I never became a studio drummer, which I could have. I mean, I have the talent. If I would have sat down and, and said, well, you know what, then maybe I'm just going to go study and read, you know, get back into reading, and I could probably get some gigs as a session drum. But I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I play drums naturally because I could just do it. And then one thing led to another, like the band thing. But all through it, I, I'm always like, I don't want to make waves. You know, if they're fighting or if this one's doing this and this one's doing that, I got to just not make waves so we can get to the next level you know, being famous. And the same thing in ISIS. I didn't want to make waves there with Carol. You know what I'm saying? Because she was tough. And if everything was the way Carol wanted it, everything was great. But if, as soon as you're trying to make any kind of wave or say, no, I don't think this is the right thing to do, then, then it's, it's crazy. So I'm, I do miss playing. I do, you know, I, I feel like I'm not done with it and I feel like I have to, again, Find myself and bring myself back. But I have to fight for me. That's what I have to learn. I know I was in rehab. I'm saying, oh, i got to save the whales. Got to save, you know, my therapist said, ha did you ever think about how about maybe you have to save yourself, you know? And I said, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good idea. Maybe I have to, you know, so it's easy to put things off on I have to do this and I have to do that. But to get back into it now is probably going to be harder than ever. And it is than anything you know, that I've ever done in my life. So, um, I do intend to do something. I'm not sure yet what. I mean, I hope I can ever get this book done, and I hope I can do, you know, some other things as far as the music business goes. I don't know what kind of business there is of it anymore, but yes, I do want to play again. Um, and, well, and I hope that you do write the memoir or the book, but do you feel like so this whole project, doing these interviews, my focus is on uh, women who have kind of been left out of the popular rock narrative, rock history that gets kind of passed down generation to generation. Um, do, you, do you feel like a part of um, you wanting to like orchestrate a reunion or writing a memoir is to kind of preserve your history and your legacy. And yeah, that's I, not, not in like an ego centric no. kind of way. Well, my ego, I wish I had one. Yeah. I mean, if I had a bigger ego, maybe I wouldn't have been in half the positions that I've been in. Cause I mean, honestly, I, I mean, if people don't remind me, they go, Ginger, you are a drummer. You are creative. You are, you know, but I didn't get that. 
in the groups, you know what I'm saying? Nobody was fast to say, oh, you know, no matter, you know, because Carol and I did, I love writing lyrics, we did, and I always have to feel a part of that band. And I'd have that, like some songs in there were lyrically something I wrote. Mm -hmm. And that then that became like a thing like, oh no, you're not a part of it unless you're actually writing for it. But people remind me all the time. So I have to, again, you know, I'm right back where I started from. You know, finding that I, yes, I am good enough, I am talented enough, and I do have something to say, and I can offer something. What, what, whatever it is out there, put that out there. Um, I mean, it's not easy talking about yourself, but then again, you know, I think it would be a good thing. I, I just feel unfinished. You know, I feel like there's still something that I have not done. So, you know, it's not going to be easy, you know, to get to do it, but I would like to leave something, you know, some kind of, I mean, people say I should, you know, that that I should offer myself to, you know, give them my experience. It's like, it, it's like, in, you know, when they, when they tell you, oh, you know, to talk about, you know, your experience or whatever, I'm like, no, I, it's not the right place I have to talk about it, you know, mm -hmm. so. And how do you feel about your, in general, how do you feel about your role and in, in your contribution to rock history? Um, I would like to believe that I, that I, that I, you know, I offered something to history for, you know, I mean, now today it's a lot different. You know, but for people to, you know, to get up and express themselves and play an instrument. But then again, again, it's not the same thing as it was back then. I, but I I would like to think I, you know, I mean, people tell me I'm a part of that history. You know, I, I it's me. I have to believe that I'm truly a part of the history. And, you know, and offer my experiences and what I have to say, put it out there. And I should be playing the drums again. Where or how or where, where that's going to happen, I don't know. But I feel like I have like one more road trip. And in a positive way. Not, I mean, let's face it, how long can, I mean, you can be in a rock and roll band. I think rock and roll is ageless in a way. Yeah. Not like blues. Blues is totally ageless. You can be 100 and be up there, you know. Like, <laughs> honestly, oh, my mom, my wife, <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to matter. It's like, but in rock and roll, it's more like, oh. I don't know, your pals in the Rolling Stones. They need. Oh, they're, they're, they're a freak. I, like a that, pack that, of skeletons. They're amazing. I know. And they, but they don't do it for the money. They, I guess they just do it because they have to keep yeah. doing it. No, they have a lot of money, too, though. Yeah, they don't really it Makes need. it easier. I know. But, but, I, but, you know, I have to, you know, maybe I have to do it because I have to get rid of this black cloud and feel like, you know, oh, sitting behind the drums in front of people. Oh, you know, it's stop, you know. It's a breakthrough time, I guess, yeah. once again. And I don't know. It's like when I was staring out the window in school and I had to get out of there. You know, yeah. and that's how I feel now in my life. I feel like, oh, I got to get out of there, and I got to get back. I got to. I mean, I love creating things. You know, yeah. like writing lyrics or stuff like that. You know, and I think I'm good at a lot of stuff. And I just have to. You know, it's gonna happen. Come up again with the with the energy to find that. For me. Yeah. Not, it's never, you know what, no one can ever do anything for anybody or become successful for any one thing. You have to do it for yourself. And I, you know, and I never did it, never could do it for myself. I'd always put everything on to any, everybody else, you know, like everyone does it, you know, but it's very hard. I don't have it, I wasn't made that way with that kind of an ego to like just plow through yeah. and that no matter what, go who what, and just keep plowing through. You know, I, I get stopped in my tracks, you know, when, when a band like Only Gingerbreads comes to an end. To me, it's just not like, huh. you know, you know you, you're always recovering. I mean, if you, don't, you don't know if anything was really that important or meant anything to you, I think, unless you're recovering from it. Mm. I mean, if it's that easy, just then it, what could it have really meant? That, I mean, for me, the way I, for myself, so... We'll see. 2018 should be very interesting. Uh, and I have a couple just general questions that I ask everyone at the end of the interviews. And everyone's answers are always very different. Um, but what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? 
is there a gender discrepancy? Is gender not really an issue at all? Um, has it changed for the better or worse since you started? It's changing not enough. Not enough history-wise. You know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame could do so much for all of this just by allowing... I mean, Golden Ginger Bits was fortunate enough to get into a display there about three years ago or four summers ago. It, it was really wonderful that they put us in there, but we never had a hit record. But yes, and the, it's, it's women today are definitely more looking bands today. I mean, there's some incredible musicians, you know, a bass player here, a guitar player there, a drummer there. I think it's Beyonce having an all-female band or something. Kick, knock your socks mm -hmm. off. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that kind of. I mean, I'm not that kind of drummer. And I used to feel like, well, how? What kind of history can you make? You, you know, you're just a backbeat two by four drummer. But that's where I'm from. And everyone had told me a million times over, that's the greatest drumming in the world. How could you think you're not a great drummer? I said, well, you know, because these people, they do this and they do this and they do, and I don't do that, so how can I be great? You know, but so, yes, female musicians today, it's musicians, for period. They're, they're up there. They're, the generations today are totally out there. They're incredible. They are so incredible. You know, it was like, again, in my day, we were incredible for our day. So in that respect, yeah, I mean, they're coming through. And, and she's like Ellen, who was fighting for the jazz musicians for the open auditions, and she finally accomplished that because this way they don't see who's playing, and if, if, they, if they're playing the part and it's right, then you get the job. You know, so I think it has grown tremendously. I think women have much more an advantage today in everything, in actually, that's going on in the world, in politics and everything like that. But I think the history of it. It's not enough. I don't think it's documented, and I don't think it, I don't think that's there yet. Yeah. As a, as a whole, like women, you know. Not like one little showing at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Traveling sideshow at the Rock and Roll Hall. Of yeah, Fame. then they took yeah. it. They put it on the road. They took it on tour. But then, they, but then they <laughs> they said, oh, you know, they were thinking of doing an an. an why would you do an addicts of a women's thing? Why don't you just blend it in? Yeah. And. I used to once want to fight for that, you know, to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, like that was kind of one of my ultimate, you know, things like, wow, it's been getting there. But then I, what does it really mean if you get in there? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people who are in there who can't, aren't doing a thing. But for women to be in there, all right, I, we never had a hit record, but the Bangles did or the Go-Go's did, you know, and I used to want to see them in there. You, you, you know, I mean, they should do one from every generation. To me, that would have been the greatest band in the world. Mm -hmm. A go-go, a bangle, the different generations, a goldie, the ginger, you know. Yeah. And put that in one band when you get that out there. Wouldn't that be amazing? So, you know, because it's, oh, no, no, the bangles or the go-go's are the first. Because that's what they only know from the 80s. But that history should be known by everyone. It shouldn't be just, it should just be there. It yeah. should exist. Bigger, way bigger than what, what it is. So on one hand, yes, it's grown. It's tremendous. It's like it's not like, oh, you see women musicians everywhere in all kinds of bands and doing very well because they can play. You know, you know, and it was, it's true. It used to be, oh, I want to hire a female. You know, that, that definitely went on. And probably some sure goes on today, but not on the level mm. that it was back then. I mean, so I think history-wise, there's, no, there's, a lot of people out there doing things like you know you're doing stuff that's great and other people are trying to do stuff and you know that's wonderful but that needs to be the music that has to be a part of history all this has to be a part of history be a part of mu the music history you know it should all just be you know in this generation there was this and there was this yeah I, I think women still to this day are not getting recognized like they should has it grown? Absolutely. Is it better? Yes. You know, I don't think today, if, if you're a male band or a female band, I think you get hard if they if they just like it. I don't think it's not so much, oh, it's a girl band. You know, because there's still a lot of girl bands out there kicking ass, you know. And then there's a lot of guy bands out there kicking, you know. I mean, the wind, and there's all, like, you know, like, in the, I don't know. I don't want to say anything too much about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but, <laughs> <laughs> or even the Grammys. 
Please, can we give someone else a turn? Yeah. I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> it's like year after year, I, I go like, well, it's like seems like the same. Well, it's because it's corporate. It's like this corporate. And entity. meanwhile, it's, yeah. how many how many bands or how many songs are really out there? Yeah. Millions or trillions or hundreds or thousands, and it's the same few. Yeah. You know, so. But that's why I really feel like these kind of, there are so many projects and collections like this around the country. So many people, women are writing Thank memoirs God. and books. And I think that, and it's weird because it's all happening at the same time. It was like three years ago when I started doing this project. I remember a couple women I asked for an interview said no because they were writing a memoir at that time. So they were like maybe a few years from now when I'm doing this thing. But it was like, it all started at the same time, and now there are all these collections and projects, and I think that that, uh, you know, th that documentation yes. will make a difference because you can't deny that people like you, people like Genya and June, existed and accomplished all of these things. I mean, you were the first all-girl band. Sent. Like, that's a big deal. It doesn't matter if you band. didn't have a hit record. It's the musicians in that band, to me, yeah. is what made it so unique. Yeah. And, I mean, that should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It should. Th if they wanted to do a pioneer thing, I don't see why they can't. Because they've done it before. Yeah. As just pioneers for that era and that time and the life that we lived and, and, and what we had done. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. They called Sister Rosetta Tharp a pioneer, and she basically invented rock and roll. <laughs> it's like, she's not a pioneer. She said, everybody, Elvis copied her. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, I know, it, but it's but it's it's an avenue like that yeah. that can make such a difference. But how do you? We get have to weasel it? our way in doing. But, <laughs> but then what you're doing with these other women are doing all this like this memoir thing. I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a chain. It's like a link and another link and another link, and yep. it'll get stronger and it'll get stronger. And all together, then you yep. burst through. I mean, yeah, I'd like to write my book and everything, but then why wouldn't I want to sit and talk to you? Mm -hmm. you? You know what I mean, people? I mean. We all have, a, I guess, a thing we need to say or a memory we have to say. Um, I mean, I hope I can do, you know, my drummer in the shadow book. I mean, yeah. I hope I can get get that done. And it, but it's also more about it's about music and drumming, but it's also about emotion. You know, and it's about life and about the person, about the about low self esteem, or about this, or about that. Not necessarily the instrument drove me in a way to get me to try to keep getting me out of myself but I think God put that in my hands to try to bring me to a point in my life you know which I'm still striving for mm -hmm. and yeah the drums are a big part of it I mean because I don't feel sometimes that I contributed anything or I don't feel like I'm the greatest drummer or I don't feel this or I don't feel that doesn't mean that's not what happened you know so I'm still I'm still out there pulling you know searching pulling myself like come on Ginger let's go you know what how much is this window going to be open? How, when are you going to get this done to find that piece or that the success is always within yourself, right? I mean, I might, what if I turned around tomorrow and I had a, a book that was a smash and I had, I had a band and, I, and I'm still going with inside myself, well, is this it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's all... It all works together, emotions, music, you know, it, it's a gift, it's, 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 it's everything. And it should be for everyone, fairly. I mean, a heart is a heart, and what it has to say it should be important to everybody, you know. So, if I was back out there again, you better believe I'd be creating. Ah, uh, man, I'd be for those musicians. I mean, I would be out there fighting for everybody and trying to get those bands into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But then I saw, I said to myself, boy, what do you need? What does it take to get a voice? So what do I have to have to write a book? Do I have to get a new band? Do yes. I, what do I have to do? <laughs> yeah, what do you have to do to say, listen? Or you need a Twitter. I mean, <laughs> always, I mean, you're going to talk to Genya. I mean, she says that little Steven's always talking to them about all the gingerbread and why, why yeah. they should be. And who they didn't get a hit record. Little Steven's someone who helped a band that I was friends with when I lived in Boston like 15 years ago. Yeah, he's always been really supportive. Of like younger bands coming up and yeah I mean they should be more like him yeah you know it's very hard I mean let's face it it's human nature you, you you're thinking you're gonna do all this and you're gonna do that and everyone should be ha should be fair but you know I guess I guess when you start to make it you start to get a certain kind of success I think after a while things 
that you wanted to crusade for or fight for. You know, the cushion comes in and you start feeling comfortable, and I think you forget. No, yeah. life isn't fair, and you just have to do what you want and do it yourself for the most part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm always like, oh, you know, you know, this one didn't find for me, or they didn't find, which is, I think, is yeah. true. But now, but like, you know, you got to fight for yourself. Yeah. Let's face it, you can hear, I don't care. I'll show you I, I, I went to coming. India. <laughs> I went to India trying to get my answers. I mean, I spent some time there, but the yeah. ashram. Oh, and, Recently? And it, or years and ago? I'm like in 96 or 98, oh, yeah? I think I was there. You know, and, you know, and it's always the same message. Yeah. It's not big mystery. So you, you, you have to fight, you got to fight within yourself for yourself. To do good, though. I mean, I'm not saying, oh, <laughs> You know, I'm going to become the most famous thing, and then I'm going to, like, Arr. Yeah. <laughs> you you did this book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they all forgive and forget. Everything happens for a reason, and everything like that. And I'm like, You everybody. forgive, but you don't have to forget. No, yeah, but forgiving <laughs> is important, but letting go is the other thing, so. Oh, I hate that. So do That's I. what I'm, uh, that was not, it's not one of my strong suits. No, I mean, if, but who... Who really can do all these simple things? I, I, we'd all be so, we'd be other beings already by now. I mean, if you could just go, oh, yes. You know? yeah. And there's people that are like that. I guess they're very evolved. I guess they, they've come, come back and forth so many times and they're done. You know? Or they're full of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's that reality again. Or they make them believe. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm guilty of sitting around sometimes just, oh, well, you know, why bother? You know, what's the point? What's Not now that you know me, Ginger. Oh, my I'm God. All the time. <laughs> now, I, now I feel hope again. <laughs> but you know why? Because I always work best with other people. That's why I'm a band person. Yeah. You know, I'm not like out there. I, you know, that's why, you know, my book is Drummer in the Shadows because seems that everything, you know, I'm always there. Did I put myself there? Maybe, you know, but that's just the way, you know, that's the way it is. But, yeah, sometimes I do feel very alive. There's certain moments when something will click or gel, and then I feel so strong and alive again. As long as I stay out of my own freaking head, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, I'm fine. So... Doing, making this giant change, you know, to get out of my my day job and everything, to turn my life around, to get to get into another position, is to try to fight harder and to maybe accomplish some of these things before uh, I don't know how long, you know, it's going to take. And I don't want to be like little, little old person <laughs> and going, oh, I finally broke through, and then I, uh, <laughs> then I'm gone. <laughs> I want to be able to like get out there and do something and and and. Bef well, I still can, you know, so it, I, it's tough, but, um, so I have to see what's going to happen in this 2018, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not a do or die year for everybody, I mean, if you're 20 years old, you're, if I was 20 or 30, God, I got time, I can do this, I can put this aside for now, but I keep telling myself, you can't put this aside anymore, you can't, you know, because the outcome is what you have to you have to live with. You know, if if the if there was an outcome of success, you know, because they always say, you know, and every, you can't rely on someone else to fill the hole. No one else out there can fill what's in here. You know, you have to be centered, balanced. When I used to go, to, when I went to the ashram all the time, and I when I was messed up, I always write about balance. You know, because you know it's so important. And I go to the ashram. And, and I go, you know, it's Christmas, and I go, oh, it's my birthday today, and I want, I want to get a name from Guru Mahan. She's got to give me a name, and I want a name that tells that I'm Durga the, the, on the tiger, and I'm just a strong warrior, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to, I'm just going to conquer everything. And I finally, after, like, waiting all, you know, I finally get up on the dash online, and I finally see Guru Mahan, and I go, oh, you know, and she's, like, just, you know, doing this blessing thing, and everyone's moving on down the line, and I'm standing there going... Okay, she's gonna. I'm gonna. She's gonna pay attention to me. I'm gonna get a name. So, she's just moving everybody along, and then I, I'm like feeling like, oh my god, 
she didn't, she totally ignored me. I didn't get, and I start walking away and she goes, what does she want? So they said, oh, grandma, you know, she would like a name for Christmas. You know, she goes, oh, I tell her to go sit on the side. So I'm like, ooh, <laughs> you know, the light being, well, that's another story, right? It's told me to go to the side, you know, so that's like the ultimate thing. I mean, oh, my God, you know, what more can you ask for in life? So finally I'm sitting there, and, she, and the guy comes, the, the swami comes over, and he goes, Groom, I said to give you this as like a little stuffed animal, and here's your name. So I go, oh, boy, this is it. I'm going to be the warrior dorger, and I'm going to be something. So I go, and I get the name, I'm reading it, I'm going, Samata, Samata, what is that? What's Samata? I don't, what kind of name is that? And I tell the Swami, I go, listen, I want the name from Guru Mai, but I, she did not call me Durga, she's calling me the Samata name. She, he goes, I said, do you think I could go back and she'll give me another one? So he goes, no, I don't think so. I, I think you have to, that's what she's calling, that's your name. That's, you should be happy with that. Settle for that. I go, but I don't want, I want to be Durga. I want to be someone like on the tiger. I want to be somebody, uh, I was like, even Sarasvati, she's for music. I said, not, I don't want to be the Samata person. So he goes, you know what that name means? I go, no. He goes, equity of mind and spirit, one of the highest names you could ever get. It's all about balance. And I went, balance? Yeah. <laughs> that's a great story. So I'm like, oh, my God. That's what I was right about, balance. How can I find that balance within myself? And that's the name I got. But, you know, I don't want to say anything negative after that, because that's a really good story. <laughs> like, and, uh, that's my name. That's what I'm talk <laughs> Balance. Um, is there, I hate asking people this because it's like, obviously, there's tons of stuff that we didn't talk about, but I want to make sure that there's nothing really important that we left out that you want to have include in, included that we missed. Well, I have to think in my brain. Yeah. I mean, something. we can always come back and do another one a year from now after the band's back together. You've started your book. And I would really like to, yeah, that book. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I just want to make sure you're satisfied. Oh, and my thing stopped again. All right. Shit. Well, I hope you got that whole story. Yeah. Okay. I think it just stopped because <laughs> I checked it a few minutes ago. All right, good. Yeah. Well, I may think of a million things when after you're gone, I'll be going, oh. But I, I, I can, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this isn't, like, the end, either. And you have to read my memoir. At it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lucky I remember anything by the time it gets read. You know, and that's another fear, too. Like, you know, you think about, oh, I'll write a book. And some people just remember, remember everything. And I'm like, how do you re remember? So, you know, that's how you're your own enemy. Because I'm going, how can I write a book when I can't even remember if I took a vitamin this morning if I took mm -hmm. two, you know, or if I... So there's all these little demons that, that hover around that make you stop and, you know, not do things, but... I don't know. I don't know. I think you remember a lot. Well, as I go, I'll probably remember. I mean, I, you know, I just... I just got to get it done. I mean, believe me, I, I, I don't even want to go back to Home Depot. I wish I could just go like a... Home Depot! <laughs> I mean, it's a job. It's one of my favorite smells in the world, though. And they when treat, I walk and they treat me Depot. well, you know, and I've been there a long time. and But it's taken so much out of me. I mean, I come from that job. I come home. You think I'm thinking about a book? I'm like, leave me alone. Shut the door. I don't ever want to go out. I don't want to talk to anybody. I mean, I'm drained. I'm tired. I've been there yeah. a long time, you know, and it's like zapping me now, you know, my energy. So I'm trying to make that change. And now, I, you know, like I was telling you before, now I have to feel like I have to pack this house up in, in five weeks. I'm like, what? So I don't know. The adventure's starting. It's going to be grueling. It's not no picnic. I mean, to leave here and go right to, to, to Southport, now that would be great. You know, if I could just go down there and get it up, but now I have to, like, make a stop, yeah. get another apartment, and then go. Um. Do you want to hear the, you know this, everything happens for a reason, though. And doesn't it? 
Well, you know what? I tried to sell this house before and I could never sell it. Yeah. So now all of a sudden it got sold like in seven days. So like I'm like, because I was going, well, when the time is right, the house will get sold. Then when it actually got sold, I'm like, yeah. oh my God, it actually got sold. <laughs> oh Jesus, what am I going to do now? You know, da, 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 da. that's how I was today. So, oh, oh no, my God, he's in the gun about contracts. I said, I thought maybe the guy changed his mind. I know, and they say everything happens in the right time. So now I'm like, oh boy. Yeah. Okay, well. I hope you got a love. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Very exciting. Great. <laughs>